Well, hello, Facebook. Here we are on this Wednesday night. It's been kind of a long day. I got kicked off with some car trouble this morning um, that led to a whole series of other things today, but anyway, that's all been resolved, and tomorrow's another day. That's all we can say. Uh, so, anyway, per par for the course, uh, this I'm going to give people a couple minutes to get logged on here, get settled in with Bibles in hand. Um, <clears throat> it's by way of proverbial announcement, um, if you will, is the best word. Um, this is going to be the last Wednesday at this hour that we're going to be doing um, the Bible study. That's not to say this is ending, but... Next Wednesday, our congregation, my Carbon Emory Church of Christ, is going back to reassembling on Wednesday nights, have our normal Wednesday night Bible classes. Um, that's beginning next Wednesday, which personally I'm very excited about. But that being said, the time frame is going to change. Um, but even though I'll be with the, the church, I still hope to have Facebook Live pulled up. So more people can tune into our study, um, but it'll be roughly ar around 6.30 or so, because we have some introductory stuff in our class, but then the actual Bible study starts about 6.25, 6.30, so anyway, um, Facebook Live will be pulled up uh, at the time that the actual Bible study starts, so Anyway, again, I can't say enough how much I appreciate you guys tuning in at this late hour. Um, especially those people, as I said before, who are in later time zones than the mountain time zone where I'm at. So, anyway, um, just a heads up on that. The time will be changing next Wednesday, and I'll keep you guys posted. But we just surpassed the two-minute mark. Um... So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you already, if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, um, go ahead and open up to Revelation three. But let's get started with a word of prayer, um, and then we'll dive in. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Father, thank you for this time of studying for this avenue of social media that we can use to study together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this book of Revelation that encourages us to remain faithful to you, knowing that there is a reward in store for our faithfulness to Christ, God. Father, we know that we are a fallen people. Um, Father, we recognize that we have sinned against you. I pray that you forgive us of those sins, God, and forgive us when we fall short of the example that we have in Jesus. We thank you that we have that forgiveness and that grace for our relationship with him. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, Revelation 3. Uh, we'll be <clears throat> wrapping up our studies on the seven letters to the seven churches um, of Asia in Revelation. And the final letter that we'll be looking at today is a letter addressed to the church at Laodicea. Um, unlike some of these other letters that we've looked at, <clears throat> the church at Laodicea, excuse me, I had a little bit, I had to clear my throat there. <clears throat> Sorry, unlike some of the other letters uh, that we've studied, the church at Laodicea is a church we have a little bit more information about outside of Revelation. Um, most of that information that we have about the church at Laodicea is found within the book of Colossians. We're not going to go there, but over in Colossians 4 verse 16, um, we know that the Apostle Paul wanted the Colossian letter read at the church in Laodicea, and in that same verse there was a letter coming from Laodicea that was to be read to the Colossians. Um, that letter is believed to be the letter we know as the book of Ephesians, but that's just conjecture. Um, from Colossians 4 verses 12 and 13, 
Uh, we know that a man named Epaphras, um, who was a part of the Colossian church, had a great concern for the church at Laodicea. Now, with all that being the case, we can assume that the church at Laodicea had been around for some time. Um, at the time, Jesus, through the Apostle John, sends this message, since Revelation was a book that was written long after the time of the Apostle Paul. It was probably the last New Testament book that was written prior to the death of the Apostle John, who was um, the last surviving apostle who is said to be the only one who died a natural death as opposed to a death by persecution, martyrdom, whatever word you want to plug in there. But um, concerning the church in Laodicea and what I mentioned in Colossians, most of the information we have about this church is found right here in Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22. So this letter is introduced with Jesus saying in verse 14, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. Now in this introductory statement, as with the other letters, um, here Jesus is addressing his message to the angel, um, or the messenger of the church at Laodicea. Now, we'll, um, just by way of reminder, the word angel, uh, it's a word that just means messenger. Um, it's not always what we think of as angels, wings, halo, whole nine yards. Uh, the word angel just means messenger. And so here, Jesus, he begins to establish his authority, as he has with the previous six letters, um, by identifying himself in a very unique way. But first, he identifies himself here as the Amen. Now, that word Amen, it's a word we throw around in our prayers. Sometimes we holler it out at church services. But if you don't already know this, that word Amen, it just means... It's a word of agreement, and it most literally means, let it be true, let it be so. And so here, Jesus is applying that word to himself, and seems to refer to the fact that Jesus himself is the source of all that is true. In other words, all truth ultimately has its root in Jesus, and so that's probably why he identifies himself here as the Amen, or the Amen. Um, depending on how you say it. But next here, in verse 14, um, we see here that he identifies himself as the faithful and true witness. Uh, this is a title that recalls Revelation 1, verse 5, where John identifies Jesus as being the faithful witness. He has the idea of Jesus being someone who can be relied upon and whose message consists of truth. Finally, Jesus uh, establishes his authority by identifying himself as the beginning of the creation of God. Now this title for Jesus uh, recalls the language of John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3, <clears throat> where we read, All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing has come into being. Nothing came into being that has come into being. So this title, the for Jesus, the beginning of the creation of God, seems to point back to John chapter 1, verse 3. But applying that here, what Jesus says of himself refers to the fact that Jesus has authority over all of God's creation by virtue of the fact that it was through Jesus, based on John 1, verse 3, that all things were created. And so that's what Jesus is doing with all these titles here in verse 14. He's just establishing his authority to say the things that he's about to say to this church in Laodicea. So having established his authority, in verses 15 through 21, Jesus goes on into the main body of his message, where three points can be gleaned as to what kind of circumstances the church at Laodicea was facing as a result of the fact that they had fallen victim, or at least appeared to have fallen victim, to an uncalling sinful pride. Um, and that caused them to lose Jesus' approval on them as a church because they got into this mindset, well, I can do it. I don't need Jesus. And 
we'll talk more about that as we get into the text. So we're going to look at those three points um, that I'm going to explain to you as we go. And these are followed by Jesus' usual concluding statement in verse 22, where he calls this church to listen and to obey the instructions that he's put forth in this letter. So after looking at these points, then what we'll learn, the application, if you will, is that if we are going to keep Jesus' approval on us as individual Christians and as churches as a whole, we have to avoid this attitude of sinful pride where we say, we don't need you, Jesus, we got this, I can do it by myself. We have to avoid that attitude if we want to keep Jesus' approval in our lives. So with that in mind, we'll just read through verses 15 through 22, and then we'll um, look at the points. Let's read this. It says in Revelation 3, 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I self to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so the first point concerning the circumstances at the church at Laodicea is that they were going to be rejected by Jesus. Um, we see this in verses 15 and 16. So this point opens with Jesus saying to this church that he is aware of their deeds, which are described as being neither hot, neither cold nor hot, um, where Jesus wished they were cold or hot. Now, as in other letters, this word deeds, we've run into it before, it just as a word that refers to the things we do. And so Jesus is saying, I look, I'm seeing what you're doing. And it, he describes it as being neither cold nor hot. Now, what Jesus seems to be referring to in this making this statement, that the Christians in Laodicea were only putting kind of a half-hearted commitment in their service to Jesus, or just a commitment that Jesus wasn't pleased with, is the bottom line. And so rather than this church having a half-hearted commitment, Jesus wished the service was cold or hot, rather than somewhere in between. Now there's some debate on what Jesus means by saying he wishes they were cold or hot. The traditional view is that Jesus saying that he was, wishes they're either completely committed, hot, or completely uncommitted, cold. But there's another view that I think fits the context a little bit better is that what Jesus is doing here um, is employing the imagery that in the city of Laodicea they lived in a valley basically and there was cold springs and hot springs both which were good but in Laodicea there was this lukewarm water that was known to cause sickness and so Jesus is basically telling them here you make me sick because that's what this lukewarm water in Laodicea caused was nausea, other kinds of illnesses, whereas the cold was good, the hot was good, but that middle of the road, not so good. And so, yes, Jesus, in a manner of speaking, is saying, you make me sick in the things that you're doing. It's really that blunt. And so he says in verse 16, he issues this condemnation, as I'm calling it, saying, you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. Now that what Jesus is literally saying there, instead of I will spit you out of my mouth, it comes from the word that refers to vomit. So it's a picture of I will vomit you out of my mouth. So using that imagery, what Jesus says here has a sense that because of their 
half-hearted commitment, Jesus was going to reject them. When you vomit something up, your body is rejecting it. So Jesus is using that imagery to say, I'm rejecting this church. And so it's a picture of complete rejection because of this attitude that um, was developing at the church at Laodicea. And so putting verses 15 and 16 together, the point being made here is that the church at Laodicea was going to be rejected. Now here Jesus is showing that the church at Laodicea was in danger of that rejection, and that's because of their half-hearted commitment. And so Jesus says, I don't want any part of you, not if this is going to be your attitude. So this brings us to verses 17 and 18, the next point about the circumstances at Laodicea, and that's that they had become proud. I've already alluded to this. But verse 17 and 18, this is really where the point comes out, that they had become proud in the sinful sense. There's nothing wrong with being proud of things you've done. You know, I'm, prou I'm proud to be the father of a now four-year-old. I'm proud to of my wife. That's a good kind of proud. But the pride that the church of Laodicea was getting involved in was the bad kind of proud. We might call it arrogance. And we see this here in the text. So this point opens with Jesus saying that even though the congregation at Laodicea said they were rich and had become wealthy, have needed nothing, that's the Laodiceans' attitude. Jesus says, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, blind, and naked. Now what this verse says here, what Jesus says here in verse 17 has the idea that even though the church at Laodicea viewed itself in this great condition, hey, we're great, we're rich, we're wealthy, we don't need anything. Jesus says, no, this is what you really look like, fitting as this wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the details of these words, rich and miserable, etc., but the idea in what Jesus is doing here is he's describing their spiritual condition. Sure, on the outside, they might look good. They've got money in the bank. They, they got, they're doing well financially. They're doing well in their own mind. But Jesus says, spiritually, mm -mm, you are not doing well. And so this is where we begin to see they become sinfully proud. Now the text does not elaborate on how this happened, but based on the language here, what seems to have happened is that the church at Laodicea, because the things were going so well for them, from the worldly perspective, they began to rely more on themselves than Jesus. That pride that kicks in when things are going well for you, you say, man, I got it made. I don't need anyone else. I don't need anything else. And so the language of this verse suggests that since the like, church of Laodicea to eat themselves in this way, they prospered materially. That's another thing about Laodicea. The city is, they were very, they were a commercial center, and so a very overall wealthy city, which may indicate that the church there was also wealthy. But because of that wealth, they developed this attitude of, I don't need Jesus. I got all this stuff. I don't need anything else. And so as a result of these things, Jesus says, well, materially you might look good, but spiritually you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Their spiritual condition before God had deteriorated, even if their material circumstances had not. So since those, since that's true, in verse seven, since verse seventeen is true, Jesus goes on into verse eighteen and says that this church needed to buy from him what the text calls gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I sell to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So this is Jesus telling them the solution to their problem, what they needed to do, and that's described here in verse 18. So again, without getting bogged down in the details, I'm not going to get into all the imagery here, but what Jesus says here has the idea that since the church at Laodicea was in poor spiritual condition, 
they needed to come to Jesus for spiritual healing. Now, as we see in the text, Jesus pictures this using these images of gold refined by fire, white garments, and eye salve. Now, these are images applied to refer to the fact that the church at Laodicea, they were in need of some healing. <clears throat> they needed to become pure. They needed, and so we see the combination of purity and healing in these images of gold refined by fire, white garments, and eye salve. So the the point made here is that they needed to come to Jesus for this healing from this condition of being wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So putting verses 17 and 18 together, the point we should see here is that the church at Laodicea had become proud. Now these two verses show us that something happened. Something happened at the church at Laodicea that caused them to stop relying on Jesus and turn to rely on themselves. Now again, being that this point is used using the image of material wealth, it's possible, very likely, that the material prosperity is what got in the way of their faith, caused them to become proud and caused them to become to rely on themselves rather than on Jesus. Now, I say that because this isn't something that's foreign to Scripture. This isn't the only instance where material wealth has gotten in the way of people's faith. Because as early as the time of Moses, back in the Old Testament, God warned his people, I'm going to bless you. You're going to get all this great stuff. But be careful. Don't let this good stuff get to your head and make you think, I did this. So again, this tells us nothing wrong with being wealthy, nothing wrong with having stuff. But the danger in being wealthy, the danger in having stuff, is that we can allow that stuff or us pursuing that stuff to take the place of God in our lives. Over in Colossians, since I mentioned it earlier, I forget the specific verse, but the verse says that things like greed amount to idolatry. Anything that takes the place of God in your life is by definition an idol. And that includes what's in your wallet, what's in your bank account, what's in your house. This device that you're watching me on can be an idol if you allow it to and forget where this stuff really comes from, from our good God. So that's your sermon for the night. <laughs> Going, coming back to the text, uh, this brings us to the third and final point that Jesus makes to the church in Laodicea in verses 19 through 21, and that is that the church at Laodicea needed to repent and overcome. So this point opens with a statement from Jesus <clears throat> saying, Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Now what Jesus says here has the idea that because of his affection for his people, Jesus corrects them, he trains them, and this should cause his people to have an eagerness about them that leads to repentance. Now we find a similar scripture in Hebrews 12, verse 6. We're not going to go there. But in Hebrews 12, verse 6, um, quoting from Proverbs 3, verse 12, the Hebrews writer says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now applying that here, what Jesus says to the church at Laodicea means that because of his love, because of his affection for these Christians, He's taking time to correct and train them in order that they might have eagerness to repent and change their lives. It's the same image as a parent who, because he or she loves their child, takes those measures to correct bad behavior. That's out of a place of love. Same is true of Jesus when he sends messages like these. It's not to get on to us, to get on our case. It's out of a place 
of love to change bad behavior. Now, one reason we know that the idea of affection is involved here is because the word for love here, it's not the agape term that refers to a love of the mind, but rather this is um, the same word from where the city of Philadelphia gets its name, phileo, is how it's pronounced. And that kind of love is, refers to the love that exists between family and friends. A kind of natural kind of love that comes from that bond you have with friends and family. And so here Jesus is using the term to refer to the fact that he has this great affection like a father to a son, mother to a daughter, friend to friend kind of love for this church. And that is why he's correcting them That's and training them to be more pleasing to him. But he's doing that to allow them an opportunity to be zealous and repent. That word zealous comes from the word zeal. just means to have this eagerness about you. But in this context, it's an eagerness about you to be pleasing to Jesus that leads to repentance. <clears throat> and this brings us to verse 20. Now, building on what he has said in verse 19, in verse 20, Jesus tells the church at Laodicea that he stands at the door and is knocking, saying that if anyone hears his voice and opens the door, he will come into him, dine with him, and he with Jesus. Now what Jesus says here in verse 20 has the sense that if anyone responds to what he's been saying, that person will enter into a relationship with Jesus, and Jesus will enter into a relationship with that person. Now as we see in the text, Jesus makes this point using the image of him standing at the door waiting for people to respond to his voice, and using this, this dining, coming in and dining with them kind of language. So in short, what Jesus is doing here is he's using the image of a mealtime occasion where he's outside ready for the meal and just waiting for the person to open the door and let him in. Now this is a common image um, because at this time and even in our culture today when you're getting together with for a meal with someone it's a sign of relationship. If I sit down to have dinner with you or to go out to lunch with you, that means we have some kind of relationship. So Jesus is using that imagery to say, if you listen to what I'm saying, I'm going to come in and eat with you. I'm going to come back into a relationship with you, which implies that in their current state of being, the church at Laodicea, is not in a good relationship with Jesus, not in a relationship at all. So Jesus says, if you listen to what I'm saying, do what I'm telling you to do. That relationship will be restored. And so with all that in mind, building on verses 19 and 20, in verse 21, Jesus offers this, what I'm calling a word of encouragement, saying, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now what Jesus says here has the idea that a person who emerges victorious over the circumstances described in this context, in the same way that Jesus emerged victorious over the circumstances he faced, that person will receive the privilege of ruling alongside Jesus as Jesus rules alongside God the Father. Now, one reason we know this is because of this word, overcomes. It's a very cool word. It's a word that literally means to conquer. And so, as that applies here, it refers to the fact that if the church at Laodicea conquered these circumstances, conquered this attitude of, look how great I've got it, this pride kind of attitude, Jesus says, you're going to be with me. You're going to be ruling alongside me as I rule alongside God the Father. Really cool picture when you think about it. Um, a similar idea is found in 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 where Paul writes to Timothy saying, 
if we endure, we will also reign with him. Same idea. That if we overcome the difficulties, overcome circumstances like are being described here, we're going to be with Jesus. Ruling alongside him in heaven. Really cool picture. So putting verses 19 through 21 together, the point we should see from these verses about the church at Laodicea is that the church at Laodicea needed to repent and overcome. Now in these verses, Jesus is showing that the church at Laodicea needed to make some changes. We've already seen that. But they make these changes not just for change's sake, but to change it change these things knowing that if they did they would enjoy the reward of ruling alongside Jesus. Verse 19 shows us that the reason Jesus informs them that they needed to make these changes is because of his great love and affection for this church. That's where all this is coming from. Jesus' love for this church. And so knowing that Jesus had this great affection for these Christians, that's the primary thing that would motivate them to do what Jesus was telling them to do. Now we can't know if they actually repented. We just can't know if they listened to what Jesus said here or just shoved it to the side. But what we can know is that they were given that opportunity. Given that opportunity to repent and as a result overcome the circumstances they faced. So this brings us to verse 22, the concluding remark, where Jesus says, I'll read it again, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now as with previous letters, this statement has the sense that the hearers of this message needed to listen, not with their physical ears, but with their spiritual ears. They need to listen to what has been revealed by the Spirit, which in context is a reference to the Spirit of Jesus, his mind and heart. Now, also, as we can see from the text, the message here, it's not addressed just to the church at Laodicea. It's addressed to all the churches who might be faced with the same circumstances of the church at Laodicea. So this means that anyone who finds themselves in these, hey, I got it made, I don't need anything else kind of attitude, need to listen to and obey the things that Jesus has communicated through this message. You need to be zealous and repentant and overcome these circumstances knowing that there is a reward in store if they do. And so in conclusion, what we can learn from this message to the church at Laodicea is that we have to avoid this attitude of sinful pride. This sinful pride that comes out in statements like we've become rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That's sinful pride at its core. I have everything I need. I don't need anything else. I certainly don't need Jesus. That's the mindset of the world. But Jesus says, you might think you got it made, but you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked if you don't have me. So we have to avoid the sinful pride attitude if we want the approval of Jesus. So how can we avoid that attitude becomes the question. One way to avoid that sinful pride attitude is to realize where all the good stuff we have comes from, from God. Another way we can avoid sinful pride is by investing in our relationship with God through things like prayer and reading our Bibles, thinking about the text, not just reading it, but really thinking about it. A third way we can avoid sinful pride 
is by having the correct perspective on our material blessings. The correct perspective on our material blessings is realizing they're temporary, whereas our soul is eternal, and that the destination of our soul is more important than the destination of our material blessings. We have to make sure we're putting more effort into spiritual wealth than we do into our material wealth. Those are just a few things that we can learn from Jesus' message to the church at Laodicea. So again, this concludes our studies on the seven letters to the seven churches. Uh, next week, when we'll be joined by people from the Carbon Emory Church of Christ, um, we'll be starting something new. i got to take a second look at my lesson plan to see what that is. But it's going to be good. Um, so on Wednesday nights, anyway, this is the last 8 o'clock Mountain Time broadcast. Um, so if all you've been able to watch on these Facebook Live studies, it's Wednesday nights. Thank you. Thank you for being here um, and supporting this ministry, as I'm calling it. Um, I hope you can continue to join us. Uh, and with the schedule change beginning next Wednesday. Uh, also, if you have any other questions or comments on this text, or anything about the Bible, for that matter, uh, drop it in the comments. Uh, shoot me a message. I love talking Bible with people, um, so I'd love to talk about it with you. But we'll go ahead and uh, close with a prayer, um, and then we'll log off of here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that you've given to us again to study this great book of Revelation. Father, after having studied the circumstances of the church at Laodicea, help us to avoid this attitude of we have become rich and wealthy and have need of nothing, but instead to recognize that before you we are poor you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, Father, I need to come to you for healing from that condition. And Father, we thank you that you have provided that healing for us, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to never take that for granted. Help us to always realize that our material blessings come from you and that they are rightfully yours. Father, we thank you. And we pray that you continue to be with us through these difficult and uncertain times. And just help us to rely on you in all things. And to rely on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgive us when we fall short. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Alright guys. Um, if you're joining us late, have joined us late, um, you can go back and rewatch this from the beginning. It'll stay on my timeline. It'll be uploaded to the Carbon Emory Church of Christ Facebook page and the YouTube channel by the same name. So, thanks again. Um, Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday night um, studying from Acts as we're nearing the conclusion of that as well. So, God bless. Love you guys. Keep on keeping on. We'll get through this. Keep relying on the Lord and um, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.